Now, we have a bit of an innovative approach today, which was suggested by Howard himself. Uh, as some of you know, we um, had a bit of a, uh, uh, it's not exactly a competition, but a selection procedure by which a number of you submitted questions uh, for Howard. So um, uh, you're going to be doing some work as well. Uh, I'd like to invite first Jeff Zhu uh, to the podium. So value investors, including yourself, talk about the importance of uh, margin of safety in our investments. Um, but as Wilbur Ross puts it, distressed investors oftentimes find ourselves running into burning buildings. So in distressed situations where prices are falling um, and you oftentimes feel like you're catching a falling knife, how do you get yourself comfortable about your investments and how do you think about your margin of safety? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. You know, th there's only one intelligent form of investing and that's to figure out what something's worth and try to buy it for less. Uh, distressed debt investing is not different in that regard. We have to do the same thing. Um, and so, you know, simply put, uh, you know, I'll exaggerate the simplicity, but you, you look at a company, you look at the business, you figure out what it could make in a normal environment, and uh, you figure out what that company would be worth, generally thinking, uh, about to, uh, to a buyer, to a strategic buyer, once its problems are largely resolved and once the capitalization has been restructured. Uh, then you think about how that value will be divided up among the various <coughs> classes of claimants and you figure out what a piece of a claim is worth and you see if you can buy it for less. So, uh, and if you... If you, can, um, if you can make those judgments on the basis of conservative assumptions and still end up with good room for profit, then that's, that's a source of margin for error. I mean, I think, that the, I think that the margin for error comes primarily from, from being able to use conservative assumptions and then still be looking at a generous uh, rate of return, you know? Uh, now, it's, it's very, but before I stop, uh, I must say that it, it's not true that the, the more conservative, the better. Because you can get to the point where you can make assumptions that are so conservative that you'll never lose money, but it will give you a target buying price, which is so low that you'll never buy anything. So you have to, you know, you have to kind of gut it out and, and be willing to include some optimism or else you'll, you may never get to buy anything. Now you gave, you mentioned catching falling knives. And my vision is that when the, when the stuff hits the fan and, it's, and there's blood in the streets, most people go like this. And they say, well, we're not gonna buy until the knife starts fall, stops falling until the dust settles, until all the uncertainty has been resolved. But the trouble is that once that happens, then the price will have rebounded. So we want to buy at a time of upset and while the knife is still falling. And I think, it's our, it's, I think that the refusal to catch a falling knife is a rationalization for inaction. It's our job to catch falling knives. That's how you get bargains. But you have to do it carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, Howard, um, Seth Klarman. Uh, who was one of the uh, earlier um, mm. presenters and whom you uh, interviewed, um, has a book that uh, the title which yeah. Jeff implicitly referred yeah. to. Yeah. Um, is your view that value investing as a category has, uh, A, gone out of style, and B, is it riskier or safer than growth investing? No, I think, I think that value investing is... Val you know, first of all, the distinction is a little bit artificial. And it's not, and, and, and anyway, it's, it's certainly not black-white. Uh, value investing means making investments based on the current characteristics and attributes and assets and values of the company. And growth investing uh, means investing primarily on the basis of, of the potential and what it might look like 10 years from now, five years from now, 20 years from now. Um, clearly, it is, everything else being equal, 
it's less risky to invest on the basis of things that exist today than on the basis of things that, that might exist in 10 years. There's no question about that. However, I say it's not that clear cut because the value of the things that exist today is largely attributable to what they'll produce, especially in terms of cash flow, over the next X years. Mm. So you can't, you can't divorce yourself from thinking about the future. You know, so, so people say, well, that value investing is about the present and growth investing is about the future. But you can't divest yourself uh, of, of thinking about the future because let's say you want to buy a, a factory that makes X, Y, Z. You don't buy it for the bricks and the steel and the, and the real estate. You buy it for its ability to produce a product that makes money. So there have to be some judgments about the future irregardless. The question really is the relative weighting. So you buy, look, back in the, comp back in, in the 99 period, they, people bought stocks of companies that had an idea, no product, no clients, no revenues, no profits. That was an extreme case, and most of those worked out very badly. But clearly, you know, uh, uh, you know the people who, in, who invent, invested in eBay or, or Facebook uh, or you know, some of these have made a lot of money. And now the, one of my, my favorite uh, quote from a fortune cookie, I actually found a fortune cookie one time that said, this, the cautious seldom err or write great poetry. <laughs> and, and so, you know, for the most part, the value investor thinks of himself as, as not erring so much, and the growth investor as writing great poetry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Seth got the title right in some sense. Yeah, yeah. I okay. think that's right. Uh, okay. Uh, Justice. Justice uh, Getman, uh, also an MBA student uh, from the class of 2019, concentrating in entrepreneurial management with a question on cyclicality. Yeah. Um, hi, Howard. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is actually one that I struggled with as an employee of your firm uh, for the last two and a half years before coming to Wharton. <laughs> so, and it's, um, it is about, um, you know, in, in corporate, corporate defaults and distress, you see cycles of seven to eight years usually. Um, and so how do you think about um, maintaining risk return discipline and also how do you think about adjusting the fairly narrow remit um, under which oak trees um, distress for control and non-control funds invest in, sure. in times like these? Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Justice. Um, first of all, let me try to convince Justice and everybody else in the room not to fixate on the regularity of cycles. I think cycles are one of the most important things in the world. And if you're going to live in the world, I think one of the most important things is to recognize cycles as they occur and where we stand in them and what that implies for the future. Uh, but I think it's really a big mistake for anybody to think of cycles as being regular. You know, the, I've just finished a book, thank you for the intro, uh, on, on the subject of cycles. It'll be out in October, uh, and it's about m managing the market cycle. And, um, uh, you know, the, the prevailing thread through the book is, is a quotation that's attributable to, uh, believed to be attributable to Mark Twain, that history does not repeat, but it does rhyme. His, it doesn't repeat. And what that means is that the, the reasons for cycles, their violence, their amplitude, their duration, their speed, or, or, and their reasons are never the same from cycle to cycle, including their timing. And the people who, who, who impute too much dependability to seven or eight years or something like that can tend to get in trouble because uh, they either anticipate too much or they miss things. Um, but, they re but they rhyme. So what rhymes, what, what does seem to recur is the fact that most things in life are cyclical and the reasons for their cyclicality. Uh, and they, they are mostly, you know, when there's too much money, when there's too little risk aversion, when there's too little fear, uh, too much eagerness, et, et cetera. And, and, uh, and uh, that's how you get excesses to the upside that have to be corrected to the downside. But your point is that, that the supply of distressed debt is very cyclical, which it is, 
We've been, in, we've been doing it 30 years this year. So you, you're right to ask about it. And you're right to, you know, it's a, this is not an investment question. This is a management question. How do you keep an, how do you keep an organization going when its business goes out of favor for 80% of the time, 60% of the time, something like that? And the answer is, you know, you have to have, first you have to hire people who are long-term oriented, who don't need instantaneous grat gratification every year. And we like to hire people who are long-term oriented, and people who are very, and you know, one of the things you need in business a lot, but you, you never hear the word used too much, is you need maturity. We have to hire grown-ups. You know, you know, everybody, there's been a lot of popularity lately about the story about the kids with the marshmallow. Everybody know the story about the kids with the marshmallow? Well, there was a, con there was a psych experiment conducted, I think it was about 40 years ago, and they, they, they took a f bunch of four-year-old kids and they put them in a room one at a time with a table, two little stools, a plate, and a marshmallow. The kid sat on one stool. The, 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 the uh, um, professor sat on the other stool. He says, you like marshmallows? Yeah, I like marshmallows. He's good. He says, there's a marshmallow. You can have that marshmallow. But I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes. And if when I come back, the marshmallow is still there, I'm going to give you another marshmallow, and you'll have two. And so the professor leaves the room. And 80% of the time, the kid eats the marshmallow right away. Hmm. And, and supposedly, and this could be an urban myth, but supposedly, they tracked the kids. And the ones who didn't eat the marshmallow were much more successful in life. So, it's, true. so it's, it's extremely important to be able to uh, subsist on delayed gratification. And so we need people who can do it. We try to create a culture where, uh, where they can do it. So we try to set up a physical and financial environment in which we in which we uh, can, can hold out for those periods. And uh, I think that goes a long way. And then you know, we, just, you know, we just try to inculcate a, a culture of long-term orientation, belief in cycles and their recurrence, uh, belief that we don't know when they're going to recur, or sometimes even why, but that when they come, we're going to do a better job than anybody else of taking advantage of them. And, and I think that's good enough. Thanks, Thank you Justin. very much. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for that good question. But that was based on inside information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, Howard, not, not only have you and Bruce multiple times described a reflection of that question, um, others have as well. Stan Drunkenmiller, mm -hmm. Seth Klarman. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to be a liquidity provider at the bottom of a cycle. Yeah. Does that link to the, this notion of uh, emotional intelligence that you're talking about? Well, it, it, uh, I would say emotional control. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, look, if you think about cycles, and this is a, 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 there's a lot about this in the book, and that's why I recommend that everybody buy several copies. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about the cycle, the market cycle, let's say, that goes this way, what's happening? So we, we're, in a, we're in one of these periods. And the economic news is good. Everything on MSNBC is favorable. The newspapers only report the good news. Everything in the, most stories can, can be given a positive spin. The companies are performing, and they're generally exceeding expectations. The stock prices are rising. The rising stock prices are making people feel good. People are turning more optimistic. Their, their fears are, are abating. Their eagerness is rising, and they're buying. And they, people tend to buy more when prices go higher. Mm. And then, of course, the reverse is true on the other side. The news is bad. People get depressed. They've lost money. They feel terrible, and they start to sell. So people tend to buy a lot here and, and sell a lot here. Now, uh, uh, unless I'm mistaken, they got it wrong. You're supposed to buy here and sell here, and not buy here and sell here. <coughs> buy low, sell high. It's very easy dictum. Uh, so why do they do the opposite? Why do people buy here and sell here? And the answer is, I think we can lump the explanation under the heading of emotion. And if, so you, you, were, you mentioned Seth Klarman and uh, Stan Druckenmiller. I mean, these are two people that have been here in this, in this series. And I think one of the things that they have in common among, uh, they're, they're very, di they're very di 
different people. They're both brilliant, but one of the things they both have in common is they're not emotional. And uh, you know, I say in my book that, uh, that, that not being very emotional is very useful in the investing world. There are worlds in which it's not such a good thing, like in marriage. It, you know, it does it, it, right? It, it, oh, yeah. uh, uh, lack of emotionality does not endear us to our spouses. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, it's very helpful to be either be unemotional or have the ability to control your emotions. You have to, I mean, when you make the really big money in this world by unhooking from the market when it gets up here and everybody and everybody's happy and nobody could think of anything that could ever go wrong and everybody thinks that, that, that the trees are going to grow to the sky and, and so you sell up here and then the market collapses and when you get down here nobody can think of anything that could ever go right again and, the, and every stock price is devoid of any optimism in, at all and that's a great time to buy. But to be that you have to be a contrarian and you have to be ability you have to be able to diverge from the crowd. Now, if you think about it, everybody receives the same inputs. We read the same newspaper. The economic news is the same for all of us. The corporate news is the same for all of us. The TTV says the same thing to all of us. Some of us see the news and the prices as a buy signal, and just when most people see the news and the prices as a sell signal, and vice versa and you want to be in the minority. Back in, back in the early 70s, somebody gave me a great gift and, and told me about the three stages of a bull market. The first stage, when only a few unusually perceptive people believed to understand that there could be some improvement. The second stage, when most people accept that improvement is actually taking place. And the third stage, when everybody and his brother believes that things can only get better forever. You make a lot of money if you buy in the first stage. You lose a lot of money if you buy in the last stage. You buy the same things, but what matters is when do you buy them and at what price. And to do that, you have to, it, it, the, mar, the prices are set low because everybody else is pessimistic. You should be optimistic. The market is set high and dangerous when everybody else is optimistic, you should be pessimistic. But it takes, obviously, emotional control to be able to do that. It's tough. Yeah. It's the minority. For a refine on the question, let's go to Julia Pei. Julia? Julia is also in the MBA program, class of 2019, with uh, a concentration in accounting. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Um, so my question is around kind of the, the market correction that everyone's sort of been talking about. Kind of nine years into a bull market, a lot of media has been talking about sort of timing as well as magnitude um, of a potential market correction or a market crash. I was curious to hear about um, your thoughts on whether there's enough dry powder in the private equity and distressed up funds to be able to potentially prop up the market if and when that happens. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, Julia, thank you for your question. Um, first, let me say that in the, in, in the economic world or in the business world, or certainly the investment world, sometimes we have an idea what we think will happen. We never know when. And the biggest problem you can have is by believing that you know when something is going to happen and acting strongly on that. One of the guys who uh, works for me once wrote a memo to his clients, and he had a, expressed a simple rule. If you name a price, don't name a date. If you name a date, don't name a price. <laughs> but if you name a price and a date, you can be wrong. In the, in the other two cases, you can never be wrong. You say, well, I think that stock is going to sell at 40 sometime. It, they can't prove you wrong, you know, uh, et cetera. So, so we, we, we talk about a correction, but we should not be so, we should not have so much hubris as to think we know when it's going to happen. That's number one. Number two, back in the crisis of 07, 08, people got into the habit of asking me and others, they kept saying, what inning are we in? This became the big question in that cycle. What inning are we in? And so, and that's the way people talk about that. Now, when they said it back in 08, what they meant is, how close are we to the end of the crisis, is what they were asking. 
More recently, they've been asking it, and what they mean is how, how, how close are we to the end of the bullish phase of the credit cycle? And I've been saying we're in the eighth inning for a little while. And I realized about a year ago that there's one problem with that locution, which is that this isn't baseball, and we don't know how long the game's going to go. In baseball, if I tell you we're in the eighth inning, that means you can start packing up. Uh, but in investing, the game could go nine innings, 11, 14. There's no limit. Like I said to Justice about his question about seven to eight year cycles, there's no limit. So the current economic recovery is uh, the third longest in history. And if it goes on for another year, it'll be the longest in history. There's nothing to say it can't. There's also nothing, there's no law, there are not laws of nature or physics at work here. So there's nothing to say it can't go another year, another two years, another three years. Anything's possible. Now, we can tell from the fact that, that no recovery has gone more than, I think, about 120 months. Mm -hmm. There must be something, there must be some reason, you know? We, we may not even be able to say what it is, but it tends to define the probabilities. By the way, most people, you probably haven't started to think about this yet, but I'm, I'm assured that almost just about everybody dies by 114. And that we, we get more and more and more people who are living past 100, and I'm optimistic about that. But, but still, almost nobody lives past 114. We don't know why. But that's the rule. So if you're, start, if you're, if you're gonna make a, put down hard money for a vacation cruise for your 116th birthday, you're probably wasting your money. And so, so the thing is that, uh, you know, th this can go on a long time. And in particular, I wanna expand on your question a little bit to say that you, you said, do I think about whether this is gonna be a, a, cra a crash, correction or crash? And uh, first of all, you have to realize that the period of time that you have seen is only a brief part of history. And you have to bear that in mind. So if you've been looking at markets, let's say, for the last uh, 20 years, it's easy to say, talk about crashes. Because it happens that the last two cyclical episodes we've had have been bubble and crash. We had the tech bubble and crash, and then the mortgage bubble and crash. That is not to say that every upswing is a bubble and, and, and has to be followed by a crash. And in fact, over the previous decades that I lived through, we had lots of minor uh, boomlets and then corrections. So, it, so first of all, don't automatically think bubble crash. Secondly, uh, Chris was asking me before, what do I think is the hallmark of a bubble? And in, in, in market-wise, I think that the hallmark of a bubble is bubble thinking. And, and I didn't get a chance to tell you what I meant. But bubble thinking, to me, is when people say, you know, there's always a grain of truth. So in 1999 and 98, the grain of truth was that the internet would change the world. And so people took that grain of truth and they ex expanded it to mean that as a consequence, if you invested in an in internet or an e-commerce company, you would probably make a fortune uh, because the internet was gonna change the world. And it happens, and by the way, and as a consequence, it, it didn't matter what price you paid. There's no price too high to participate in that kind of a trend. And it turns out that the internet did change the world and probably 99% of those companies ended up valueless. Mm -hmm. So the point is that when you reach the point where people have separated value and price considerations from platitudes, and things have slipped their moorings and gone off into infinity, that that's a bubble. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that kind of, if, so if you hear people say, price doesn't matter, no price too high, then I think you're in bubble land. You know, I started in the investment business 
uh, 50 years ago, in the summer of 1968. I was between years of grad school, and I had a summer job at Citibank in the Investment Research Department. And at that time, the New York banks invested in what were called the Nifty 50, the stocks of the 50 greatest, fastest growing companies in America. IBM, Xerox, Coke, uh, Avon, Merck, Lilly, Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, Perkin Elmer, AIG, and on and on like that. And they were selling at astronomical prices, 80 to 90 times earnings. You know the average PE ratio for us post-war period is 16 times earnings. So they were selling at five plus times the average. And the official dictum at the bank was that the price didn't matter. Mm. You didn't have to look at the price because if it was a little too high, so what? It's growing so fast, it'll just grow into the price. And if you bought the stocks when I got there in 68 in, uh, and, you, and you diligently held them for five years, you lost 90% of your money mm. because it turned out the price does matter. So that's, to me, that's the mark of a bubble. Um, now, I know you had a question in there someplace that I haven't answered. Remind me of, <laughs> remind me of the question. Um, just in thinking about whether we call it a crash or a mm. correction, mm. Um, sort of the next market correction, oh. is there enough dry powder with oh, yeah. private equity oh, yeah. and distressed debt funds to you know, potentially prop up yeah. that market? Well, I, 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 <laughs> thanks for reminding me. But I think the answer is uh, probably too much. And, you know, the... The, the private equity in particular, there's more statistics on the private equity industry than the distressed debt industry. You know, one firm had a fund close last year. They raised $24.5 billion with one closing, one day. And it, it's not a big deal to raise $20 billion anymore for the big boys. And the middle-sized boys who used to raise five now raise 10 to 15, and the little guys who used to raise two raise nine. And it's estimated that there's $1.7 trillion of buying power of, of dry powder, of equity, uncalled, uninvested capital in the private equity funds. That's, uh, that's $1,700 billion. And of course, private equity firms, to get the returns they need, despite their fees, tend to leverage three to four times. So if they're going to leverage four times, that's $8.5 trillion of buying power. So I think the, I wouldn't worry about there being inadequate buying power to prop up values. I would worry about there being too much buying power to be gainfully employed. But Julia's uh, phraseology might be the key. There's enough to prop it up. But that doesn't say well, in that area. value. Yeah, right, right. Well, by the way, I'd rather it didn't prop it up because I'd rather things got cheap so that we could buy bargains. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, Really, we have no fun in our business, as, as Justice suggested in his we, You know, we're in hiatus now. We're in, and it's no, it's no fun. We're not happy when, when we can't buy bargains. The money manager, any money manager, has three jobs. Raise capital commitments, use them to buy bargains, harvest when the time is right. It all depends on the middle one. Because if you can't buy bargains, raising capital doesn't do any good, and harvesting isn't profitable. Mm. So you know, we're kind of, we and the rest of the world are kind of, like I said, you know, on, in hiatus. Now, the good thing about the money management business from, for its own selfish purposes is that most money managers get paid even when there's nothing to buy. That's not too great for the clients. And, and th there may be a point in time where the divergence of success for the managers and success for the clients becomes a problem. But, but right now, the money management firms able to raise a lot of money are still raking in a lot of fees, uh, despite the fact that there aren't too many bar bargains to be had. Thanks, Julia. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, when you and Bruce were together here in, mm -hmm. as part of the series, uh, you mentioned and, and Bruce uh, mentioned that um, you were net sellers of distressed yeah. debt. Yeah. Has that position continued? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we've, I think in, I, I forget what exactly the statistic is, but either, either in distressed debt or in all of our closed end funds over the last few years, we've sold four times what we bought. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't sell distressed debt. 
we buy distressed debt and we sell it when it's not distressed debt. And, and that's one of the ways you make a lot of money. But I mean, we, we help restore companies to viability. We can take them through legal uh, balance sheet restructurings. Yeah. So, we, we, so it's a misnomer to say we buy, yeah. we sell distressed debt. Yeah. By the way, I used to have a boss uh, uh, at Citibank in, uh, in the mid 70s who used to, well, you wouldn't remember Johnny Carson, you, were, you wouldn't remember Karnak the Magnificent, <laughs> but he used to dress up in robes and, and he would hold questions up to his head, you know, in an envelope. And, the, and he would say, Schlumberger, Schlumberger. And then he would open the envelope, which is, anybody know what's the name of the oil service company? And he'd open the envelope and he'd say, what it's called at 100. And then he'd hold up another envelope and he'd say, Schlumberger. And then he'd open the envelope and say, what it's called at 15. You know, so the po the point is that we like them. Uh, I once uh, prepared a slide called "From From Weeds to Flowers," which was based on something that Warren Buffett said to me. He says, "I like to buy them when they're weeds, not flowers," and the same is true of us. We like to buy it when it's distressed debt, not when it's restored debt. Mm -hmm. But you're 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 staying put yeah. at a hundred billion. Yeah, we yeah you're not, you're not, we've had a hundred billion under management for about four years now, mm. and we just don't think it's the right climate for us to increase. Mm. Okay, all right, thanks, Howard. Uh, the next is Andy Liu. Andy, please join us up at the podium. Andy is an undergraduate uh, here at Wharton, uh, also in the class of 2019, with a dual major in finance and statistics. Hi, Mr. Marks. Thanks for being here, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I guess my question kind of follows up uh, one of the previous questions, so about emotions and, and soft skills when it comes to investing. So you write about it in your memos and in your book. Um, so things including patience and fear and uh, intellectual humility and second level thinking. So given kind of the, uh, what you've seen of the rising investors today and these kinds of soft skills, what do you think uh, the advantages are for this generation and the challenges for this generation uh, in relation to the past generation? Thank you, Andy. Um, and by the way, I'll, before I forget, I want to say thank you to all the students who are asking the questions. They're great questions, and, and uh, uh, you were, we, we selected you from everybody who submitted questions, and now I know why. Uh, but, but uh, you know, look, when I was getting out of Chicago in 1969, I applied to six different jobs in six different fields. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I happened to take a job at the, in Citibank in the Investment Research Department uh, because I had done it the previous summer and I enjoyed it. That's all. And uh, all six jobs paid the same amount, twelve to fourteen thousand dollars, and that was not per month. And <laughs> and and so I took the job in investment management. And I enjoyed it, and I made like what any good corporate treasurer or you know exterminator would have made. And and then back in '82, when the crisis of the '70s was over, and they got inflation and interest rates under control, God looked down, and He said, "You see that group of people over there? I'm going to let that group of people make a hundred times what everybody else makes." And I'm not exaggerating. And that's what happened to the investment managers. And, and uh, you know, if I, were taken, if I had taken one of the other five jobs and done an equally good job, my net worth would be 1% of what it is today. And I'm not exaggerating. And, and so this is abating, this phenomenon, which some would call nutty, uh, and certainly, I would say, unjustified. Uh, you know, I mean, people are realizing now that a lot of investment management has underdelivered, and that a lot of investment managers haven't earned their fees. And you know, the, certainly the bloom is off the rose with regard to the hedge fund industry. Uh, and uh, you know, t 10, 15 years ago, you could leave Goldman Sachs, raise your hand, and say, "I'm starting a hedge fund," and everybody would say, "Oh, please take my money," you know, and you'd have a billion dollars the first day. Uh, Maybe that was for anybody. I mean, it was, if you were coming out of Goldman, maybe you'd have more than a billion on the first day. But the point is, you know, I wrote a memo about hedge funds in 04, and I said that I think going forward, the average hedge fund's going to make 5 or 6% a year. And eventually, people will get tired of paying 2% plus 20% of the profits to make 5 or 6%. And you know, I got a call from Barron's 10 years later, and they said, we're doing an article about that memo. And the average return over the last 10 years has been 5.2%. 
and it took even longer still for people to conclude that it was a bad idea, but now money is flowing out of hedge funds. And, and by the way, and there's a huge movement now from active equity management to passive and to index funds and ETFs and smart beta and all that stuff. And the main reason is because the active managers who charged high fees didn't earn them. It's not that indexation is better. It's just that it's not inferior mm. and it's cheaper. Maybe better sometimes. But the point is, the point is, so you asked about the challenges for your generation. So one is don't expect this free money machine to continue forever because it doesn't make any sense. And in economics, eventually things that don't make sense stop happening. Um, the other thing is that when I started in, in high yield bonds, uh, uh, back in 1978, I got the, the call that changed my life. My boss called, called me up and he says, there's a guy named Milken or something out in California and he deals in something called high yield bonds and can you figure out what that means? That was 40 years ago, this summer. And, and you know that gave me a seat in the front row at the big show in history and 1977, 78 is the year that the high yield bond world started. So it's great to be in at the beginning. If anybody has read Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Outliers, which talks about demographic lock, that's an example of demographic lock. I didn't do anything to arrange to be born in 1946. It just happened, and that happened to be the right year to be in at the start of, of high yield. Um, and when I started in high yield, when I got that call from my boss, I looked around and what did I see? There was no history. There was no central trading information. There was no performance data. Uh, most people didn't know about them. Most people didn't understand them. Um, they had a dirty name. They called them junk bonds. 90% um, of investment organizations had a rule against buying a bond rated below A or below triple B. And Moody's, which rated bonds, defined a B rated bond as follows fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. In other words, it's a bad idea. They didn't say at what price. It, maybe it's a bad idea at par, but it's a good idea at 90 or 80 or 70. But their definition was it's a bad idea. So if you have all these bad marks against something, isn't it reasonable to think that maybe you can find a bargain there? And that's what happened. Fast forward to today, now everybody knows everything. You know, all the performance data is available for everybody, so there's no more ignorance to trade off of, and there's no more scruples. You know, back 40 years ago, people would say to me, well, young man, I can imagine that you could make money that way, but it, would be, it wouldn't be right to invest in junk. It would be unseemly. We couldn't do that. And today, anybody will do anything to make a buck. Uh, so when you have, you no longer have ignorance, and you no longer have prejudice, where are the bargains going to come from? So it's harder. And maybe the big money has been made in high yield bonds and certainly in hedge funds and maybe in private equity. And you know, the, 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 the private equity guys like KKR and Blackstone probably attracted $250 million for their first fund. Now they can attract 100 times that. And they probably can't invest that 100 times as well as they did the first 250. So, it's, it's just, and by the way, when you've, have you learned about the efficient market hypothesis? <laughs> what does it mean? What it means is that if there's a good idea and it works for a little while, other people will figure that out. They'll emulate it. The field will become more crowded, and it'll stop being such a good idea. That's, just, that's what it means, and it makes perfect sense. Nothing else makes any sense. How about, I have a great idea. I know how to make a lot of money without taking much risk. Nobody else will ever figure it out, or, in, or and I'll have that market to myself forever. That makes absolutely no sense. So the answer is, the world has become more intelligent, and you're going to have to work harder than I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's, Andy, thank you so thank much. You. I appreciate it. Uh, for, again, another kind of refinement, let's ask Jason Zhang. 
uh, to join us uh, at the front. Um, Jason is an undergraduate at Wharton and the college in the class of 2018 uh, with a dual major in finance and also economic history, which is uh, an eternal subject of yours. Good. Jason? Thank thanks for being here with us, Mr. Marks. My question is um, in regards to your recent memo titled Yet Again. Um, so in the memo, you wrote a lot about passive investing and how a reliance on non-discretionary buying is taking us away from a focus on finding the right value. Um, what are your thoughts on shareholder activism, which some may see as on the opposite end of the spectrum? Well, thanks, Jason. Um, so, you know, when I went to, we didn't talk about this too much at, at uh, Wharton, but when I went to Chicago, they had done a lot of research to, to, which showed that the average mutual fund had done worse than you would have made, would have done if you just bought the S&P or the Dow or something like that. So some people started saying radical things like, well, why don't they just buy one share of every stock in the index? And there was no word for it in those days, but that turned into what we call passive investing or, 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 or and, and it, it, it led to the creation of index funds, the first prominent one of which was the Vanguard 500 index fund in 1970. Five, as I recall. So, um, you know, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, most active managers have not done as well as the index. And by the way, it doesn't it stand to reason to think that on average, everybody's going to do average before fees and below average after fees. So it's only the exceptional people who can beat the index after fees. Not everybody not the average person, but the exceptional. Further, we talked earlier about the emotional challenges of being a contrarian and adding value, and most people aren't uh, in control of their emotions. Most people are, by definition, not contrarian. So there's been a strong movement toward uh, index investing. Uh, you know, it used to be something of a novelty uh, back in 1975 or even 85. And today, it's, it's a real thing, and lots of people are replacing their, their active managers with, with uh, passive, uh, largely because the actives didn't, didn't do any good. And, and, but as you point out, uh, Jason, in, in passive, uh, people just buy the, the same stocks in the index in the same weighting as the index. Now, the irony of this, I want to, before I move on to your real question, I just want to point out what I think is a supreme irony of this, which is, why do the stocks in the index have the weighting in the index that they have? Where do these indices weightings come from? They don't come from up there. They don't come from the operation of nature or physics. This stock has a, has a value of $80 billion. That company has a value of $180 billion. Why? Partially because what the companies accomplish, and partially because of what the investors say they're worth. So the, 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 the market weightings, the prices, and thus the weightings, are assigned by whom? By active investors. And yet there's a trend to passive investment on the premise that the active investors don't really know what they're talking about. And yet, the, 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 the MO of the passive investor is to emulate the decisions made by the active investors who they think are idiots. So it, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, that, that's, what, that's what passive is doing today. And we have to wonder about the wisdom of passive investing. And the, you know, so one of my clients called up and said that, uh, that she has a new treasurer, and the new treasurer wants to put all the, the whole portfolio into an index fund, all the stock. Fire this manager and that manager, that manager, not, not us, we don't manage equities. But put all the money into an index fund. What do, what do I think? What should she say to her treasurer? I said, ask him how he feels about having all his money invested in funds where nobody is thinking about which stocks should be included or what they're worth or how they should be weighted. 
Anyway, so that's, I think that's a very extreme thing. It used to be that the active managers did all the work of studying companies and figuring out the prices and the weightings and all that stuff. And so the, if a few people came along and wanted to kind of free ride passively on their efforts, they could just emulate their decisions and not pay the research bill. That was a good strategy. But what happens when most of the people are free riding? Who do they free ride off of? That's, that's the question that I, I think you'll enjoy thinking about. Now, that, then you want to go to the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about activists. So activism sounds like, you know, kind of like apple pie and motherhood, activism. Isn't it good to be active? Well, activism means people who buy material stakes in companies and present themselves as agents for change and usually insist on either a change in the way the company operates, a dividend, the sale of a unit, or seats for themselves on the board. And so far, so good. You know, there is, when I went to Wharton, one of the things I was taught was that one of the great advances in society, in economic, in the economic sphere, had been produced when we separated ownership from management. Because, you know, uh, Jay starts a company, and it's a great company, and then it passes down a few generations, and then his, his uh, limited uh, you know, grandson still is running it, not so bright, not doing a great job. Well, guess what? Jay, the, the grandson says, you know what? It's not really going so well. I'm going to hire a professional manager. So he steps down, and a professional comes in and does a better job. And now we have separated ownership from management, and in general, the world does better economically speaking. So that was considered to be an advance in those days. The problem is, what happens, as has turned out to be often the case, when the incentives of the managers diverge from the incentives of the owners? That's not a good thing. You know? And let's say, let's say the company's doing poorly, but the managers keep voting themselves big raises. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and rewarding their bad decisions. Etc. So that's why, and, and, and you know, most, most uh, investors prior to, let's say, the last 15 years ago were pretty passive with regard to the companies, and they kind of rubber stamped the decisions of the managers, including their raises, and, uh, and reelected them, and so forth. And uh, that, that didn't seem that, that satisfactory. So the activists came along and said, we're going to stir things up, we're going to represent the owners, we're going to be active owners, and we're going to require we're going to hold the manager's feet to the fire. We're only going to give them raises when they earn them. We're going to make them sell off underperforming assets uh, or, or whatever it might be. All sounds really good so far. The, the real question, uh, Jason, is whether these activists are long-term oriented or short-term oriented. I'll give you an example. And, and, and long-term activism is probably a good thing if they are really long-term oriented. But, but you know, there's no requirement that they hold their stock for a long time. And he, a great example is somebody who gets control, who, who, who buys 2% of the stock of a drug company. And he says, uh, you know, I think that this company would, would, would report higher earnings next year if they closed the research department. So they close the research department. They fire all the scientists. The earnings go like this. But then, of course, since they run out of products, the earnings go like this, and the company goes bankrupt 10 years later. So the, again, the, that activist had another set of interests that diverged from the, those of the company or of the long-term holders. So I think that activism is a good thing if they have a long-term perspective. Uh, the goal should be to make the company better, not to get the stock price up. There's lots of things you can do in the short run to get the stock price up, which are not good for the company. <clears throat> and those things should not be encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, thank you. Howard, we have just a few minutes left. Um, could you comment a bit uh, to people in this room who are investing perhaps in the most important capital of all, their human capital, about the role of human capital and the role of education in your life? Uh, and maybe close it out with a few comments about uh, its enduring character, which you talked a bit about b beforehand, but I sure. thought it was so valuable. We will be remiss in not mentioning it. Well, look, 
when I, I was a kid growing up in Queens, New York, I didn't know school was important. I didn't work hard. Um, I, my mother came back from every parent-teacher conference and said, your, your teachers all say you're an underachiever. And I didn't know what that meant or why that was a problem. And then, <clears throat> and then but, that, but I, somehow or other, I decided I want to go to Wharton. I went to the guidance counselor. She said, you'll never get in. And, but uh, I happened to be taking accounting. The accounting teacher was the manager of the tennis team. He let made me the, he put me, uh, kept me, I, I carried the balls around. He liked me and he, and he wrote a letter and somehow or other I got into Wharton. And that changed my life. And when I went, my high school had 1,284 kids in each class. And because of the numbers, you were limited to four college applications. And um, so I used one for Wharton. And then I, everybody saved one for the free city college, my Queens College. That left two, so I applied to, to uh, a, an abject safety school and then a middle-level state's university. If I hadn't gotten into Wharton, I would have gone to state university, and, and, and who knows what would have happened then. By the way, I wrote a memo back in January of 14 called Getting Lucky, not in the campus sense, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> And in which I say that I think I've been very lucky in my life, and I talk about some ways in which I've been lucky. And I, and I, I think if you've been lucky, the, the greatest thing is to recognize it and celebrate it. And the people who've been lucky and don't admit it are really a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, but so, so the point is, I came here, and I got a starter education. Wharton in those days was pragmatic and practical and qualitative and and real worldy, and then I went to Chicago, which was theoretical and, and quantitative and a very good complement. And the combination of those two things, especially to be in the, one of the first classes at Chicago that was taught the new Chicago School of, of Theory, was a great start to a fortuitous career, you know? And um, so, I think that, you know, I think that I, 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 I hesitate to think where I would be today if, without Wharton and without my education in general. And it's a great thing. And I, I hope you're all appreciative. And I hope you go out and, and make the most of it. Um, and as the development office says, and don't forget to give back. Uh, <laughs> Linda Kronfeld sitting in the front row, she, she grabbed me 30, 27 years ago and started shaking me. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and it's worked for both of us since then. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, th the great thing about investing, I, I, as I said, it's going to be harder to make money in the investing business going forward than it has been in the last 35 years, uh, as, and it should be. Uh, but it, it can still be very rewarding, because investing is intellectually challenging. It's always different. There is no process, in my opinion, that always works, uh, and which means you have to be adaptive and flexible, and, and uh, you have to see things as they really are. And, uh, and it's, it's extremely stimulating. And uh, if you try it and you like it, uh, if, it's, if it's for you, I think it's a great field. And I would still, I would still urge you to do it if, if, if it's right for you. It's not right for everybody. You know, there are fields. Uh, by the way, there's a book called Fooled by Randomness. Who's read that? OK, that's a pretty good ratio, uh, 10%. Uh, you know, but it's a good book. And, and Taleb, the author, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote The, the Black Swan, said, ta always talks about the difference between being an investor and, and being a dentist. And, and he says that in, you know, in dentistry, there's no creativity and there's no randomness. You fill a tooth the same way every time, and you get a good result. Investing, there's a lot of randomness. There's a lot of creativity required. And it can be super interesting. And I would say uh, you know, that we have boring days, but we never have boring years. Um, uh, my friend Sandy in California used to describe his job as an airline pilot as hours of boredom, punc boredom punctuated by moments of terror. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of ours, too, but I recommend it highly. Howard, thank you so much. Okay. Please join me in thanking Howard Mack.